thank you all so much for coming and welcome to our All Wales Fuel Poverty Forum. Um, as many of you will know, I actually left at NEA in early 2019, early last year, but I'm absolutely delighted to rejoin and to rejoin in a new role as head of NEA currently. Um, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to work with you all again, and particularly keen in the early days to get a forum up and running like this. So obviously whilst we can run it virtually, it gives us a really good opportunity to gather together. And while we continue to deliver our advocacy and training, I'm working with colleagues um, across NEA to rebuild our work in Wales. And as many of you will know, this is a really, really critical time, of course. Um, the Climate Change, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee has recently concluded its inquiry into fuel poverty in Wales. The Welsh Government has now laid its response and is busy preparing to consult on its new fuel poverty plan for Wales, which will set the framework for action for years to come. And the Minister, Leslie Griffiths, has said um, that um, they're due to be published by the end of September, all being well, with a view then um, to having a 12-week consultation and then the final plan being published in February 2021, ahead of the Senate elections in May. That's something I'll come back to um, during the policy update. But right now, though, we know, of course, that the far-reaching impacts of COVID-19 are not being felt equally. In 2018, it was estimated that there were 155,000 fuel poor households across Wales, potentially, I think many, many others now. And I also suspect that those that were in fuel poverty before, those that may find themselves in it now, are likely more exposed than they've been. So I'm really grateful uh, today that we can gather together to look at some of the immediate and emerging impacts of this. Um, some of you may have the copy of the agenda in front of you, but just in case not, um, we'll kick things off um, now with a policy update, which I, I will deliver in the coming moments. And then we'll hear from a colleague of ours, Jamie, who's a senior policy research officer at NEA, about um, something called Connecting Homes for Health, which is a pilot project that's run and the report has just been released, which she's going to talk about um, looking at providing free gas connections, first time central heating and energy efficiency advice to some vulnerable and at risk households in, in northern England. Um, that is pre-recorded, as you'll see from the slides behind me, um, because Jamie um, has recently given birth late last week to a beautiful baby uh, so she's currently off on maternity leave but she had the foresight to record her policy uh, her update um, before she went so that's fantastic and then I'm really really pleased to welcome a couple of people that you'll that you'll know no doubt Joanna Seymour and William Jones from Warm Wales and Citizens Advice Keradigion respectively will be talking about their work and the impacts COVID has had on the work that they're involved in and the people that they support. Um, if we can, I'll have time for some Q&A um, at the end of my policy update and also perhaps at the end of Joe and, and William's um, presentations. And a colleague of ours, Helen Stockton, is available if anybody's got any questions um, originally for Jamie about the Connecting Homes for Health. But we'll also make sure in the second half that we break into a virtual workshop looking at what it's been like to work through COVID-19. Really, really keen to hear from all of your views and experiences. So as so long as the IT plays ball, we'll break into these virtual breakout sessions where we can split um, into about kind of groups of about 10 or so, so people feel comfortable and hopefully able to share some of their views and thoughts. So I'll explain a bit more about that as we go through. And of course, thank you very much to colleagues who have um, played a big role in setting this up today. Um, but to kick things off, um, let's have a look at some of the latest policy and, and practice updates. So um, I think front and center, of any of this right now is that it seems it is more crucial than ever that people can afford to keep warm over winter, particularly this winter. As I say, we know that the far reaching impacts of COVID-19 are not being felt equally. It's exposed to existing inequalities. And there is a clear link, sadly, between those medical conditions, those cardiovascular and respiratory conditions that make COVID-19 worse or put you more at risk of COVID and those that are exacerbated by living in a cold and damp home. And as many of you may be aware, um, the UK government and energy industry took commendable early steps to help protect domestic energy customers during the crisis, agreeing on the 19th of March, not long after lockdown, um, proposals to proactively identify, prioritise and support vulnerable consumers at risk, including broad principles around extending discretionary and friendly credit for prepayment meter consumers, in some instances, sending out preloaded prepayment meter top up cards for those that might otherwise be unable to afford to top up. Um, if you're on smart metering um, and in smart prepay mode, being able to switch into credit mode to ensure you had continuity of supply, um, as well as advice around flexibility um, on debt repayment. 
plans and the commendable early steps to do so so quickly. But we and others, I'm sure, um, also saw several issues during those early stages that would definitely need to be resolved if we were to ever have a, a period of a second lockdown. And much of this is um, looked at in a short briefing paper that um, more esteemed colleagues than me produced in April called Addressing the Impacts of COVID-19 on Vulnerable Energy Consumers. There's a link at the bottom of the slides there. And as I say uh, to Andy earlier, when, when these get shared, you'll be able to click through and, and find that paper also. But for instance, we found that often households aren't always aware of the support that is available to them, particularly if they're rural or digitally excluded. And obviously, often you can be both. Um, and it means that I think going forward, we need to find ways to disseminate information over more channels and in more languages. And NEA and others I know have been trying to communicate the support that is available. But for example, there is no public platform where that support that is being provided by individual utilities is regularly updated so it can prove challenging and of course even where households are sometimes then aware of the support that is available to them they then can face difficulties or further challenges in accessing it um, we know that businesses are working around the clock to ensure that they can help households but we've encountered a few barriers like call centers asking for emergency calls only um, but not necessarily being clear on what constitutes an emergency and of course some business as usual issues are considered emergency for some um, as well um, obviously um, suppliers and others have had reduced staff numbers at times which have caused call delays which we can understand um, but also households are not always ask, uh, comfortable asking for help as we know but then getting third party access to accounts can be difficult when you're not in the same room or in the same advice setting as you ordinarily would be. We need to find going forward ways of accessing authority to enable households to help remotely. Um, and finally, we sometimes find as well that that support isn't necessarily consistent across suppliers, um, that there's variation. And whilst those broad principles were in place, organisations approach the situation in different ways different ways in which discretionary credit might work, for example, across suppliers or different criteria in order to access debt relief. And on the topic of debt relief, um, there we are very conscious that there may be a large gathering storm building. And again, this is the title of a paper that we produced in June, which you can access following the links provided. But energy debt itself was a significant issue for customers and for industry before the crisis. And we fear it's likely going to be even more urgent now. Many households, often low income households, have seen significant reductions in their income. I'm sure many of you will have seen this over recent months, maybe owing to furlough at 80 percent or in some cases redundancy or being laid off entirely and when you pair that with an increased usage by being at home more and a rise in estimated bills as meter readers don't get out in the normal ways to take meter readings we'll find that there's an increased and deeper indebtedness that more and more people in Wales are falling behind with their gas and electricity and I should add that this is a, at a time of year when ordinarily they might prov be provided with opportunity to actually catch up a bit for some because it's in the summer months as opposed to in the winter. So falling behind at this time of year ahead of winter could be very difficult indeed. Yeah. Um, and in fact, Citizens Advice Cymru has recently reported that nearly 300,000 households in Wales have fallen behind on one or more household bill as a result of the outbreak. That may be gas and electricity or rent or council tax, for example, but 300,000 people is about 10% of our population and that's on top of what those that may have already have been in debt prior and of course debt adversely affects people's health their wealth their well-being the economy and suppliers and industries finances also and it is imperative that it's recovered fairly so on the topic of fair recovery, as some of you may have seen, Ofgem has been broadening their work around this area recently with some of their work around self-disconnection and self-rationing. If any of you are unfortunate enough to follow me on Twitter, you may have seen that I sent out a thread a couple of weeks ago expressing my pleasure at seeing that not only now will all suppliers need to identify all prepayment meter customers who are self-disconnecting and offer them support. But secondly, all suppliers will also need to offer emergency and friendly credit to all prepayment meter customers too. But thirdly, and this is the one I'm particularly pleased to see, the ability to pay principles, which have been inconsistently adopted, shall we say, since 2010 when they were first introduced, will now be brought into license, meaning that when suppliers have reason to believe or become aware that somebody is having difficulty paying their bill, that they need to take into account that household's ability to pay it back and that that will now be enforceable. So that places into license measures that not only 
have to force the suppliers to take into account how you pay for your gas and electricity when you fall behind, so i.e. what methods you might use, prepay, direct debit, standing order, whatever it might be, but also how much you pay back towards it, at what rate. That is very important indeed. I've actually worked with those principles myself for almost a decade now, directly with suppliers on households behalf in an advisory capacity initially, in training advice staff when I was originally at NEA in the first years as well, and um, in discussion with key stakeholders throughout that time. And I've seen that when you put those pr uh, principles into practice, they can make a real positive difference to people to now see them into license where they will become enforceable is a really good step. Um, but of course, more can always be done in this phase too. For example, we could have set minimum levels of emergency credit and standardised mechanisms to access discretionary credit so it's consistent across suppliers, for example. We might need to have a specific financial vulnerability flag or needs code on the priority services register as there isn't one yet. And of course, there's a role for government too in ensuring that debt advice is funded sufficiently. And that they could consider the funding payment matching schemes, for example, for debt relief, like happens with, with water in the water industry. Um, so this is really very important. And in addition, the UK government also needs to extend and expand the warm home discount scheme. As some of you may be aware, this is something we've been jointly campaigning on with Fair by Design over the last six months or so. And I know that a number of you across Wales co-signed a recent letter to the Minister at Bayes calling for this. And the minister here, Leslie Griffiths, also sent a, a letter also. So thank you all for, for your involvement in that. Uh, as many of you will be aware, the Warm Home Discount currently supports about 80,000 households in Wales with automatic payments of £140, plus thousands of others will also receive it via the broader group. But as things stand, the Warm Home Discount is actually due to come to an end in March at the end of this financial year. So it's absolutely crucial that we can see that extended beyond into April and ongoing after, um, after that. Plus, obviously, hopefully see it expanded so that perhaps those on the broader group would start to receive it automatically rather than have to reapply every year like they do currently and have had to do over a number of years prior. And again, if you'd like to see our report that we released outlining some of the need for this, then there's a link in the, in the slides there. Um, and then finally, looking forward, as I mentioned at the very, very beginning, the Climate Change has concluded, uh, sorry, the Climate Change Environment and Rural Affairs Committee in the Senate has concluded its inquiry into fuel poverty in Wales now, making 21 recommendations in its report. The Welsh Government has laid its response. And the new fuel poverty plan, which, as I say, will set the framework for action for years to come, is expected to be published for consultation by the end of September, with a view to the final plan being published then in February 2021. Um, it should, you know, appropriate time now to reiterate that this new fuel poverty plan for Wales will be absolutely vital in helping households to live in warm, healthy homes. And I really hope that over the coming months we'll have opportunities to engage with you all on this in due course. Your insight, your experience, your views are absolutely invaluable. And so we'll be in touch as soon as we're able to look at, to look at doing that. Um, and then finally, just as a final plug, some of you may have seen that we're currently running a series of free training webinars online. The training team has done a fantastic job over the last few months to move things online whilst we can't meet in face-to-face -face groups. And we've currently got three courses available, all running free of charge, which if you haven't done before, or you know others who might wish to do so. Um, I'm just going to introduce my colleague, Gareth Thomas, who's our trainer and project coordinator at NEA Cymru now, who will just share a little bit about these training and where you can find some more information. Over to you, Gareth. Hello, uh, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, borrowed data, everybody. It's lovely to um, put some faces to names. Um, that's right. I joined back in, in November of last year. So a, a very um, quick sort of baptism of fire, uh, getting out and delivering a couple of courses as a shad, you know, to get my skills up. Um, then obviously lockdown started. So it really has been a, a slightly different way of um, you know, different experience in, in turning these products into webinars, much like we're meeting today on Zoom. So the, um, some of you might be familiar with the, the level two fuel debt, and that's a city and guilds accredited course. It's normally um, delivered in one day. It's now delivered in, in sort of bite size half day sessions. It takes a little longer, but it still covers all the um, causes of and ways to tackle debt relating to energy costs. 
costs. Um, the two shorter courses that we're advertising at the moment, the vulnerability in the domestic energy market, looks at the supplier obligations, many um, options around supporting people who are in vulnerable situations. And, you know, as, as Ben's alluded to, things like the priority services register and the types of um, assistance schemes open to, to people. And likewise with the fuel poverty and health, although more of a focus on the health impacts of cold homes. Um, all of these are, are advertised with dates, current dates on our website. If, um, if you're not familiar with those, we'll put a link into the chat at some point as well. But um, yes, it, it would be great to see many of you um, joining in with these over the next month. And we also have some other products in the pipeline as well, so please keep your eyes on that. Um, lovely to meet you all. I thank you. I'll hand back over to Ben. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, so that brings an end to the, the policy update that I wanted to run through briefly with you all. We've got a bit of time before we move into Jamie's pre-recorded session. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? now and um, just for your information at the bottom of the screen if you hover over the participants list it should bring up a column on the right hand side in white where you can see the chat participants list also and uh, halfway down or so at least on my screen you should see a little blue hand that you can raise if you want to ask a question or you're welcome to put something in the chat box um, or if nobody has any queries then we can obviously move on but if anybody would like to ask a question there's an opportunity to do so now Okay. I think Peter Hughes may have a question. I spotted, I said, apologies if others do too. If you wouldn't otherwise mind raising your hands and hopefully colleagues can, can see as we go through. Peter, would you like to ask yours? Yeah, hi Ben, can you hear me okay? I can, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you very much. Um, it was about the fuel poverty and health course. It looks quite interesting. I just wondered if that was also accredited or are these, um, they'd not come with a qualification? The shorter courses. As far as I understand, and Gareth's very welcome to jump in here, but I don't believe the fuel poverty and health course is accredited with city and guilds in the same way the level two fuel debt advice is or the level three energy awareness course, um, but they are CPD certified. So you, if you accrue the CPD points, you can do so and can, you can get the certificates in touch with our wider colleagues. Is that right, Gareth? That's right, Ben. Perfect. Okay. William, I understand you have a question or so? Um, hi, Ben, and my apologies, I had technical problems for the delay in joining the meeting today. Um, it's really encouraging to hear that Leslie Griffiths has supported the campaign for the extension of the Warm Home Discount. I just wanted to, I wondered, obviously the Warm Home Discount's been £140 for a number of years. Is part of the ca campaign to actually raise the amount as well as to get it extended? Thank you. Um, I must confess, William, I don't actually know whether we've called for the, the rise in the warm home discount in terms of the actual payment itself. Um, I think one of our main calls has been that um, you wouldn't necessarily then need to keep reapplying every year if you were part of that broader group. As we know, obviously, if you're on the core group, you should receive it automatically, although it's always worth checking. But if you're on the broader group, even though, you know, increasingly now, as we know, it's been running for a few years, people would be notified away from when it's coming out. We do find, you know, particularly with a number of suppliers, that they have proportionally a, a minimum number of consumers that they have to give that warm home discount to. And as soon as they hit that level, it tends to close. And we've all seen instances of some suppliers opening that scheme up in a particular month. And a few weeks later, and I think there's been a shorter example than that, it's suddenly closed again as they reach that threshold. So obviously, if um, more people can receive it and receive it automatically, then hopefully then it won't be a matter of making sure you've opened your post in time. Otherwise, you, you miss out because we know that payment's such a huge amount of money for people but I'll check as to whether we've made a call for um, actually an increase in the money itself and I'll, I'll get back to you if that's okay. Ben, can I just jump in here? I, th I think we all have to think NEA and St. the Vice asked for it to be increased last year. I think the response we got back last year is if we increase it, if we increase the, the actual amount that's paid there will be less people that they can cover. That's how they, I think that's how they responded last year is they'll keep it at the 140 but it means that they will be able to pay more more people. If they increase the amount that paid on the warm home discount, there will be less people who will uh, qualify for it. But I think we, that's the answer we got back when we raised it last year. Fab, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, does anybody have any... Yeah, you're absolutely right, William, about a one-week application window for utility. I remember that. Um, does anybody... Um, 
Does anybody else have another question before we move through to, to Jamie's session? I can't see any hands, so let's let's move forward. Brian, would you be happy to um, share um, or Mike uh, share Jamie's slides? And uh, <coughs> mentioned Jamie's not live today, given the birth of her baby late last week. So this is a pre-recorded session, and if there's any queries after, a colleague of mine, Helen Stockton, is available to take those. So I'll be quiet and hand over. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Lee Rosenborough, Senior Research and Policy Officer at NEA and I'm here today to highlight some of the impacts achieved and lessons learned as a result of our Connecting Homes for Health pilot research project. Before I go any further, I'd like to share Steve's story with you. Steve is a disabled war veteran. He suffers from PTSD. He lives along with his dog, Baxter, whom he considers to be his closest friend in the world. Steve had to leave his job due to ill health. His income was drastically reduced and he had fallen into arrears with his mortgage payments. He was in dispute with the Ministry of Defence over the calculation of his war pension and he was living on universal credit. He had one inefficient storage heater in the living room and two portable electric heaters. He could not afford to pay his energy bills. He generally found himself sitting in the dark and cold at home. He would wear a pair of leather gloves to try and keep his hands warm, but that wasn't enough to prevent the pain creeping into his joints and causing him great discomfort. But he preferred to suffer the pain in his hands than to risk falling further into fuel debt. At one point, his universal credit payments were temporarily stopped. For days, he did not eat, but drank only water. Steve felt incredibly ashamed of the circumstances in which he found himself and had progressively cut off contact with friends and family as a result. He did not want them to see him struggling and was too proud to stomach the thought of their pity or their offers of help. Feeling cold, hungry and isolated made it harder for him to cope with the symptoms of his PTSD. The only person he ever really saw was his dad, who was suffering from a terminal illness and lived nearby. One year after participating in the Connecting Homes for Health scheme, Steve is transformed. He has an efficient and fully working heating and hot water system and knows that he can stay warm when he needs it. Despite using his heating system more, his energy costs have reduced so much that he is now able to save money each month. He even has £500 in his savings account. He can afford to buy the food he wants and not just the bare minimum. He has even had help in securing a manageable repayment plan with his energy supplier and is gradually clearing the fuel debt that he had accrued before signing up to the scheme. His leather gloves are no longer needed when he's at home, his hands do not hurt anymore and he can take regular hot baths to further help manage his joint pain. He feels financially independent and happy. Because he no longer feels hungry and cold, he feels as though he is in a better place mentally to be able to deal with the symptoms of his PTSD. His voice now sounds bright and upbeat, whereas before he sounded sad and forlorn and was prone to tears. He says that letting the NEA advisor into his home that day was the best thing that he has ever done. The team, he says, has transformed his life, has given him health and financial independence and given him hope once again. The Connecting Homes for Health pilot research project aimed to test and measure the impact of applying health-based eligibility criteria to the provision of free gas grid connections funded through the Field Poor Network Extension Scheme and free first-time gas central heating measures alongside tailored energy efficiency advice and support funded through warm home discount industry initiatives on the health and well-being of vulnerable residents who are in or at risk of fuel poverty and at risk from cold related ill health. The research element of the project was funded by Northern Gas Networks. The concept of proportionate universalism put forward by Michael Marmot argues that actions to tackle health inequalities need to be proportionate to the level of disadvantage experienced by different groups in society, i.e. the most vulnerable will need additional support. A mapping exercise was therefore designed and carried out for County Durham and Sunderland. This involved identifying GP practices within the two local authority areas that were showing a high prevalence of multiple cold related ill health indicators according to the quality outcomes framework using a weighted ranking system. These were then overlapped with the index of multiple deprivation rank along with additional deprivation indicators and fuel poverty prevalence at ward level in order to give each GP practice catchment area an overall health deprivation fuel poverty risk score. 
Fourth quarter following within a two mile radius of each of the highest scoring practices were identified and given to NGN, who carried out an additional layer of mapping to identify which properties were off gas. A comprehensive desk based evidence review was carried out to understand the relationship between cold homes and ill health and to inform development of the eligibility criteria for the scheme. The full review can be accessed on our website. The pilot needed to balance narrow eligibility requirements to capture the most vulnerable, whilst allowing for some flexibility to capture other households in need. So I'd now like to touch on some of the impacts that were achieved for households, starting with the impact on their home heating and control experiences. Before receiving support, 76% of participants were not satisfied with the temperature in their home. One year after, 100% were satisfied or very satisfied. Before, 59% were not satisfied with how easy their heating system was to use. Within a year, 100% were satisfied or very satisfied. 74% were not satisfied with the amount of control they had over their heating before receiving support, but again, 100% were either satisfied or very satisfied afterwards. While 64% were not satisfied with how well their house kept the heat in pre-intervention, post-intervention, 86% were satisfied. The experience of subjective fuel poverty was also significantly reduced amongst participants. Before receiving support, 93% of households were in subjective fuel poverty. Within a year, this had reduced to 5%, meaning that 95% of participating households were not in subjective fuel poverty after receiving support. One year on, 100% of participants said they were satisfied with the new gas central heating system. It was also now easier for 90% and cheaper for 68% to heat enough hot water for their needs and 35% use more hot water than they did before. 91% of those who had solid fuel systems before said that heating water in the summer no longer made their homes too hot. The experience of Carolyn and Lynette highlights the importance of having access to affordable and reliable hot water. Carolyn lives with her teenage daughter, Lynette, Carolyn is partially sighted and suffers from multiple health conditions. She's also the primary carer for Lynette who has chronic bronchitis and asthma and who suffers from chronic skin and joint conditions. The pair live in a private rented semi-detached home. Before the heating system did not work and would constantly trip out the electricity. It was extremely inefficient and costly to run. Nevertheless, she had to have it turned on all the time to make sure the house could be warm enough for Lynette. As a result, she was falling deeper and deeper into fuel debt. The immersion heater did not work well and Carolyn struggled to fill a bath with hot water at any one time. When she did want hot water, she had to wait for up to two hours. This made it practically impossible for Lynette to use hot water to manage her joint and skin conditions in the way that she needed. When they wanted to bathe, they had to go to her grandmother or her aunt's home instead. When things got really bad, Carolyn would borrow money from her sister to cover the cost of her energy bill. The home that Carolyn had envisioned became in her mind an unsanitary place which represented danger, discomfort and a risk to her own health and that of her daughter. One year on, and Carolyn and Annette now have access to a working central heating system which provides them with as much heating and hot water as they need without having to worry about the cost. Their energy is cheaper and they have succeeded in having some of their outstanding fuel debt written off. Lynette is able to have as many hot baths as her condition requires and her respiratory symptoms are less severe when she is warm at home. Carolyn is now pleased that she doesn't have to worry about keeping the whole house warm all day. She feels relieved that Lynette now has access to a comfortable environment in which she can be homeschooled without risking a worsening of her respiratory illness. They've been able to decorate and take pride in the beautiful home which they've been able to create. Carolyn has told her landlord that should they decide to sell the property, she'd be keen to have first refusal. This is the place where she wants to live and where she wants to stay. It is her home. Indeed, the project either made energy bills more affordable or did not increase bills for a large proportion of participant households. Before, for example, 70% had found it hard to afford their energy bills. After, 79% found it easy. Before, 35% felt that their energy bills were manageable, but this increased to 77% afterwards. 
Similarly, whereas before only 34% felt their household budget was manageable, afterwards 67% felt so. The intervention also had an impact on the self-reported physical and mental health and wellbeing of participant households. For example, before intervention, 14% rated their physical health as either good or very good. Afterwards, 74% did so. Before, 37% rated mental health as good or very good. Afterwards, 79% did so. Before, 83% said their physical health was affected by being cold at home. Afterwards, only 7% felt that this was the case. Similarly, before, 48% had said that their mental health was affected by being cold at home. Afterwards, only 5% felt so. And finally, whereas before intervention, 73% said that their ability to cope with an existing illness was affected by being cold at home, only 5% said that this was the case afterwards. Let's take a look at May's story. May is retired and suffers from COPD. At the point at which she signed up for the scheme, her lung capacity was at 39% and she would be constantly wheezing and struggling for breath. May previously had a solid fuel heating system in her home, which she hated. It was difficult to manage and she struggled to fetch the fuel she needed from the outside store due to her breathing. She was convinced that the ash and the dust created by the system was contributing to her respiratory illness and helping to make her symptoms worse. Not only that, but it made her reluctant to have her young grandchildren over to visit. She worried that two toddlers running around the living room were in danger of suffering serious burns and injuries should they fall over near or get too close to the fire that was in the middle of the room. One year after, and her, her gas central heating system has been installed and May was saving between £80 and £90 a month on her fuel bills. Not only did this mean that she could now afford to buy more food and other essentials, but also that she could allow herself a little treat every now and then. She was finally able to put money into her savings account each month, which made her feel content and secure. Her lung capacity had increased over the period of a year from 39% to 50%. When her doctor expressed surprise and pleasure at the improvement and asked her if anything had changed, she said that she told him that it had been down to her new gas central heating system. She said that she was warmer and that the system was much cleaner and she no longer felt that she was breathing in harmful substances while she was at home. She did not have to struggle to bring fuel in anymore and could instead just enjoy the warmth and the financial savings. Her children had noticed that her chest no longer made a constant rattling noise and that her pallor had improved. She no longer looked grey. Furthermore, she'd been able to spend more time with her young grandchildren as she was now confident that they would not hurt themselves when playing in her living room. Instead of worrying about the dangers that her home might represent, she could simply enjoy being with her family. May felt as though the scheme had changed her life for the better and likened it to having won the lottery. Taken together, these results show that the application of the health-based and financial eligibility criteria and targeting me mechanisms to the project was successfully able to reduce the experience of health and other social inequalities in extremely vulnerable households. However, the delivery pathways developed and enacted during the delivery phase of the project were also key in enabling such results to be achieved. Ultimately, preliminary mapping is important to identify target communities or areas, but that should be the start and not the end point of a successful recruitment strategy, especially when it comes to engaging and retaining the participation of extremely vulnerable clients. The reality is much more complex and much more expensive to deliver. In the case of this project, it meant repeated letters, phone calls, text messages, face-to-face -face home visits, door knocking, private and social landlord liaison. It also meant managing communications with local councils and parish councils and taking on board the processing of FPNES paperwork. Not only that, it meant organising and carrying out house clearances and storage space, coordinating the provision of small measures such as carpets and curtains, identifying and booking adequate interpretation services and making onward referrals to other agencies able to provide additional support for multiple vulnerabilities. Ultimately, it's about fully understanding individual household situations and needs. At times, the application of a small crisis fund meant that the project was able to retain the participation of households who would have otherwise fallen by the wayside. 
Importantly, the retention of such households was achieved by spending relatively small amounts of money. The key factor was in staff taking the time to understand the barriers facing each individual household and creatively seeking out ways that would remove that barrier. The extra time and effort spent in recruiting and retaining the participation of vulnerable, hard to reach households was also necessary when securing gas connections for hard to connect properties, especially where legal complications can arise when having to seek permission to work on private land, for example. Challenges were encountered with regards to identifying whether a household had a meter point reference number or NPRN, as well as in securing a timely gas meter installation. In this instance, for example, a company called Citrus Energy was identified who, as part of their energy advice and switching service, are able to secure first time gas meter installations by comparing deals and installation timeframes between different suppliers. They secured a turnaround time of 10 days instead of three months to get gas meters fitted. The team were furthermore unable to identify official minimum energy efficiency installation quality standards and so produced an installation checklist that installers had to use to ensure works were carried out to the highest of standards with appropriate quality assurance text, checks and visits then being carried out. It was also important to work with installers who understood or were able to be flexible in relation to the vulnerabilities of households. Our report sets out a number of both practical and policy-based recommendations to facilitate and enable the replication of the delivery pathways identified during the Connecting Homes for Health pilot scheme. Details of all the recommendations that we are making can be found in both the full report and executive summary. So that brings me to the end of a somewhat whirlwind tour of the project. If you're interested in finding out more, please visit the project page on NEA's website. You can also email any as research or policy manager using the addresses shown on screen. Thank you very much. Right, I'll, I'll step in. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ben's back. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I was just going to fill in for you. Right, I realised my video was off and, and so was the voice. Ideal. Um, yeah, so... Um, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jamie, wherever you are. Um, but Helen Stockton is just available if anybody would like to ask a couple of questions in relation to, to Jamie's pre-recorded presentation there. No, I don't think so. Um, one of the key things, obviously, for me that comes out of out of that is obviously not only the impact on people's health and, and warmth, but it's that, that and the heating that they have within their homes and their ability to use the controls um, and, you know, and whether it then saves them money that they're spending each month, or whether they then get more warmth out of the money that they're spending, even if that's largely in line with what they were spending previously is obviously so, so important and will then have a big impact on their health and warmth and, and well-being and their subjective understanding of whether they're in fuel poverty or not as well. But if no one has any questions, what I shall do is introduce Joe. Thank you. Sorry. Ben, I was just going to say, uh, sorry to interrupt, um, I was just going to say to, um, to the audience, um, if, if they can have a look at the report, um, please do. We've also got some very short infographics coming as well, which condense the findings down. But I think one of the things I just wanted to highlight, as well as the, um, the fantastic impacts that we've seen um, from the pilot research, which um, highlight the, um, the benefit of combining um, you know, the Fuel Public Network Extension Scheme with capital measures funding for central heating is some of the replicable pathways that have been identified. Um, so this is, you know, um, which I'm sure your audience are, are more than familiar with, um, the steps that you go through to help some of the most vulnerable, which are often, um, you know, much more complex and more detailed than you might do for people who are, don't demonstrate such um, complex vulnerability. And um, so just wanted to signpost everyone to go and have a look at the report and the um, infographics will be ready soon as well. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, super. Okay. Um, and the link is the link is in the, the chat function as well um, that Brian's just placed in, in there. Okay, without further ado, I'll hand over to Joe Seymour, project manager for the North Wales team at Warm Wales, who's going to share a bit about their work uh, and the impacts COVID in recent months has had on the work that they provide and of course the the, the people they're providing support to. Over to you, Joe. 
Okay, <clears throat> can you see my screen? Can you see the presentation? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much um, for inviting me here. Um, my name's Josie Moore, and yes, I'm the project manager for Warm Wales, um, and I manage um, the delivery and a small team uh, in North Wales. I am an environmental health practitioner by background um, with 16 years experience working in housing and public health. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you today um, about the work of Warm Wales, um, how we've adapted in light of the pandemic, the challenges that we've faced, um, and also to give some feedback from some of the residents that we have supported. Um, hopefully, as Ben said, there'll be some time at the end for some questions. If not, all of the ways that you can contact me are on the front page, including my email address. If anyone's got any questions or wants to discuss anything further, um, to just get in contact with me via email. Oh, love this. So, anyone know how you change the slides? I was just pressing the right, the right arrow key on mine to go through. Does that work for you? No. Why is it that it worked on Friday? <laughs> Spacebar. <laughs> Joe, if you're using two screens, move your mouse over to the screen with the presentation on and just click on, on somewhere and then try that. <gasps> yes, thank you. Probably. Love it. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, so, Warm Wales. Um, lots of you probably heard of Warm Wales. Uh, we were established back in 2004. We are a community interest company um, and we have been um, providing support to communities in Wales on energy saving advice and fuel poverty support for the last 15 years. And we work to alleviate fuel poverty in Wales and the southwest through community projects and partnership working. We aim to provide homes with affordable warmth and to alleviate fuel poverty. And we know that there are three main factors, fuel poverty, looking at low income, high energy costs and poor energy efficiency. So the work that we do tries to look at uh, prevention, affordability and accessibility. So what are we actually doing? Well, we are and we deliver the Warm Homes Assistance Scheme on behalf of Wales Most Utilities. Um, we've just started the Eco3 management on behalf of Powys Council. We have our Healthy Homes, Healthy People project energy switching, fresh vulnerability mapping um, to aid better identification, partner referrals and also look at void properties. So I'm going to talk more about um, our project Healthy Homes, Healthy People um, and what we're sort of trying to do. So this is looking at the prevention side and we're making sure that residents are living in safe, sound, warm, secure housing and they've got access to affordable warmth and we all know the impact of living in cold, damp homes have, because we've just heard about it um, previously. And we know that the impact of living in a cold, damp home can have, it can result in increased deaths and illness, along with social isolation, stress, worry about heating bills and debt. And it can affect children as well as adults and have a negative impact on life, including attainment. Plus, we've already heard now the impact that COVID is also having. So Healthy Homes, Healthy People takes a person-based approach to reduce avoidable health inequality, improve health and well-being, and reduce fuel poverty. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to give residents access to healthy homes, lives and communities by meeting residents um, to ensure that their basic needs are met so that they can go on fulfill their full potential. We do this via engagement, education, encouragement and empowerment. As we said, we want to ensure that everyone has access to safe, sound, secure and warm housing to enable people to live, grow and work and play in. Healthy Home to Healthy People has been delivered via, by Warm Wales since November 2017 and it's continued to grow in its success and it's spread across the whole of Wales. It's delivered on a community basis um, and as I said before we use our fresh mapping to identify areas that we can target and we can look and we can establish whether or not there is need by looking at data such as Welsh induction multiple deprivation, energy performance difficult data, income, health, cost of utilities, not being on gas, being off gas, and it obviously it allows us to identify the greatest need. And we can also start looking at whether or not we could um, start looking at those areas that have been hardest hit by COVID, because obviously the impact is not just from a health side, but also from an economical basis. But we also work in a referral point, and we can set up agreements so that referrals can be made via a portal or via our new health partnership. 
So what sort of things do we offer? You can see on the screen, we have food offer for everybody. Um, so energy saving advice, tariff switching, um, carbon oxide awareness. But we've also got those that are um, via criteria. And these areas are split into five. So we have um, home and personal safety. So like I said, such as carbon monoxide awareness, excess cold, damp and mold, slips, trips and falls. We then move on to money maximisation and family and personal support. So this looks at reducing your energy and water bills, support with debt and support for housing. Moving on to affordable warmth. So this is then looking at how you make uh, your property more affordable to heat, looking at your tariff, looking at helping with debt, looking at grants for heating or energy efficiency measures and then looking at health and well-being. So this is looking at your physical health, your well-being, reducing isolation, but also linking in with social prescribing and those new pilots and projects that are coming in. And then the final level, number five, is then looking at personal social engagement. So this is making sure everyone's got a, um, their basic needs are met. So it's looking at making sure that they've got access to food, they've got access to housing. So since the project started in October 2017, and until the end of June um, this year, we have saved residents a total of £1.7 million and have visited 2,731 and we've assisted far more residents than that. So that all sounds good. We've been helping lots of people and then we entered a pandemic and everything changed. So now I'm just going to go through a little bit about what we've been doing um, more so in North Wales, but how we've adapted both North and South to be able to still deliver and still provide that support um, to those residents um, that we've identified um, that, need, that need help. Um, so what we've had to do is we've had to go from being out and about to being working from home um, and we've started delivering um, support via the telephone. Um, and that has actually worked really, really well. Um, we've been able to link with Flincher and Denbyshire Voluntary Councils, um, which has mean that we've been able to provide that initial support to those individuals who've been after um, prescription collection, um, shopping collection, shopping delivery, uh, befriending. Um, and that has enabled us to be able to get in contact with more people who we wouldn't necessarily be able to get in contact with. We've also got our ongoing referrals um, that we've got from um, most of the organisations that operate across, um, across North Wales, um, but also working with our health professionals. So what have we been able to do um, between March and June? So this is activity that's been undertaken in North Wales. So in that period, we received 482 referrals, um, which is an awful lot of referrals. Um, and you can see from those, 422 of those were as a result of COVID. So being impacted, whether or not that's because they were isolating um, or because of a reduction in their income. And we've delivered 1,850 interventions. All of the people that we spoke to, we provided them advice on how they can save money on their energy bills, their water bills, signed people that met the criteria up to the Priority Services Register, but also were able to provide ongoing support to them. So far to date, um, we've saved just over £15,000 to those people that we've spoken to. Um, and on top of that, um, 101000 um, on installations of heating systems via the Warm Homes Fund project that we're doing in partnership with Flincher Council. Um, so we're still being able to deliver that work and provide support. Um, but something that's come out of it is that we've been able to and had to provide 25 emergency food parcels. Um, 15 referrals for emergency top-ups for gas and electric and also we are now a um, referral partner to the British Red Cross Emergency Fund um, and we've made two referrals so these are for individuals who had no access um, to money um, so you know as in it has seen <clears throat> the difficulties that people have been um, basically accessing um, and coming across um, throughout that time. So if I just give you a little bit of feedback um, and some background to a couple of residents that we've supported. So you'll see on the screen, so um, <clears throat> this resident um, had a debt relief order, um, they're struggling financially in lots of ways, suffering with uh, mental health. So we were able to provide food parcels, gas and electric top up um, by Kais Hardship Fund. Um, because she was in arrears with a gas and electric and every time that she put £10 on, um, basically, you know, as it got, it got reduced. 
She had three young children, um, is pregnant and had to walk over two miles to the nearest pay point um, because obviously the pay point, um, you know, as in sort of top ups have been reduced. So, you know, as in it was a quite difficult situation and we're still providing support um, to this individual to get out of that, that sort of cycle um, and those issues. And again, some more similar issues um, to do with somebody um, was on maternity leave already, <clears throat> but the partner had been put on furlough. So again, reduced income. Um, she was suffering from anxiety and had to access food banks. Um, again, not able to afford to top up gas electric, to top up food. Um, but we did a lot of other referrals on top of being able to get basic needs, um, food bank vouchers, but also looking at income expenditure, referral for budgeting, mental health support. I'm not going to read out what's on the screen to do with the feedback, but basically, you know, as I'll just read the first, I feel that since I've been in contact with you, you've had that you have lifted a massive weight um, and that you're such a lovely person and I don't like asking for help but you've helped me every step of the way and that she's a much happier now. So this is feedback from one of my, one of my colleagues. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think, you know, to do with, you know, as in sort of what we're seeing, the impact of this, the impact of COVID. On the screen, I've tried to give you information about how you can make referrals through to both the North team and the South team. Telephone numbers, there's email addresses, there's access to the, um, on the website that you can put, um, we've also got a portal on there as well. I'll make sure this information is sent out to you. Um, and then, Ben, do you want me to go through this quickly? That's okay, I'll do that, I'll do that in yep. a moment if you like. That's yeah, fine, that's, that's, fine. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, thank you so yes, much. Jane. There we go. Um, are you happy for us to share the slides and circulate them with everyone participating today? Yeah, yeah. I know I speak very, very fast and I have got a lot, so I try to fit a, it all in. Yes. No, thank you. If you wouldn't mind um, stopping yep. sharing your Nothing. slides, that's really fantastic. Thank you. And I know that you and the team have been so busy with all the work across North Wales uh, recently and that food poverty and, and others has been such a big part of what you've done alongside fuel poverty and, and fuel debt and things too. So no, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, William, if you're happy, we'll... Um, pass over to you to talk about your work in, in Ceredigion, if that's okay. And then perhaps if Joe and William don't mind, we can take any questions just after William brings his presentation to a close. I, um, hopefully, I will, hopefully you can hear me and hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, so my name is uh, William, oh, that'll help if I started in the right place, wouldn't it? There you go. So my name is uh, William Jones. I'm the Energy Advice super, uh, Supervisor for Ceredigion Citizens Advice. Um, you mentioned earlier on in, your, in some of your opening briefing, uh, Ben and I think Gareth, about the training that uh, NEA and NEA Cymru provide. Um, in the six years or so I've been working on fuel poverty in Wales, uh, the training resources of uh, NEA Cymru have been uh, very, very supportive, not only to myself in terms of doing the Level 3 City and Guilds uh, energy efficiency qualification, but also the Level 2 fuel debt and the community qualification, and also having done a behaviour change course in uh, energy advice with NEA Cymru as well. What we will always do with our colleagues who uh, come in to work in the energy projects in Citizens Advice uh, Caridigion is we would always try and get people onto these excellent courses which give people the really not only the skills and the confidence to be able to advise people on energy advice and energy efficiency, but also provide excellent resources as well. Um, so I, I would, you know, to uh, give a further plug to Gareth and Ben, what they said earlier on, um, I would strongly recommend if you haven't yourselves been on these courses, or if you have colleagues who are working in this area who uh, need the sort of uh, expert uh, training that NEA Cymru provide with the qualifications which are obviously you know really good for our future careers as well as let alone in our current careers I'd really strongly advise uh, people to do that. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about will have some overlap with what Joe has just spoken about as well but I'm just going to go through the sort of energy advice projects that we have in Ceredigion, the approach that we have to our work 
uh, and some of the current projects that we are uh, working on. And I've got a little bit of um, sort of, I was asked to reflect a bit about uh, COVID-19 uh, and how the NEA might be able to support us uh, with our work going forward. So I have got a, a slide about that as well. So it's just a little bit, you probably, a lot of people here uh, probably worked with Citizens Advice, uh, our actual Citizen Advice uh, staff. I just thought I'd put in just a reminder about uh, what Citizens Advice is all about and what we aim to do. Um, I won't read through all of this, but I think one of the key things is we want to provide advice to people. We want to provide independent advice to people. We also, though, are a campaigning organisation. So we're not just trying to help and resolve the individual problems that people face and present us with. We're trying to use that evidence to identify where people are, are suffering detriment in some way, to be able to coordinate campaigning, uh, to try and ameliorate uh, fuel poverty, not just for the individual, but for the broader society by trying to bring about change in policy, change in legislation, etc. Um, I had the opportunity recently with other colleagues from Citizens Advice to uh, be invited to a focus group for the uh, Climate Change, Environment and Rural Affairs Committees uh, looking at fuel poverty that Ben uh, mentioned earlier on. So that's a kind of example where we can actually use the experience, the data, the empirical evidence from our casework to be able to try and make a difference uh, to policy and law within Wales. Okay, so I'm going to move on a bit about what we, how we approach energy advice. And let's say there's obviously going to be quite a lot of similarities with what Joe was talking about a few moments ago. But the key to the way that we will approach advice is the idea of holistic advice to try and reduce fuel poverty, and if it's at all possible to actually eliminate fuel poverty for individuals, we can't just look at um, how you can potentially save money by energy efficiency, switching access to the warm home discount, um, helping people qualify for the help you tariff uh, if they, uh, for their water, et cetera, et cetera. All these things obviously really help and are really beneficial, but in many instances, the best way you can assist people in trying to rise out of fuel poverty is actually by increasing their income. So a lot of the work that we will do will actually be always looking at what people's income is. Are there any ways in which we can assist them in, in increasing that income? Particularly maybe lots of people are obviously on fixed incomes, people with disability issues, uh, people who are never going to increase their income through uh, unfortunately are going to have the opportunity to increase their income through work etc so what we're looking at is trying to ensure that they're getting the benefits that they're entitled to and in many instances identifying that they're not getting the benefits that they're entitled to so assisting them not just in just not not just in referral or uh, signposting or identifying that they might qualify for personal independence payments attendance allowance if they have disabled children uh, dis, uh, disability living allowance for their children but actually assisting them in making those applications because as we all know these are very complex applications people really struggle with them and often people will want to downplay the difficulties that they face in their lives so they'll sort of put minimal information on the applications whereas us as uh, professionals understand the depth of information that is required to comply with the requirements of the benefits. So we have obviously, therefore, hopefully have a better chance of securing that money for people. So that can lead to huge increases in people's income so they can afford their, uh, their energy. And also what you will often see is the fact that people will actually end up spending more on energy because they're underheating their homes. There's such a, a, you know, evidence that we see with our clients who are, of people who are underheating their homes because of their low incomes, which is resulting in, um, you know, a reduction in their well-being uh, with all the sort of links to uh, detrimental health outcomes that have been referred to in some of the previous um, presentations. So 
that is one of the key things that we do in all our work. Um, we also, as I say, because of the qualifications that we have, we are, uh, have the competency and the specialism to give people energy advice about how you use your energy in your home, identifying any issues to do with condensation, reducing the risks of conversation in people's home which again obviously can be very detrimental to respiratory illnesses etc we do a lot of referrals to and we're partners with uh, nest uh, we work very closely with Cowardick Young County Council who have uh, an eco flex scheme and they also have funding for a scheme called cozy Karen so again with grants for people to put in replacement or new heating systems we do a lot of uh, obviously assisting people with switching. I've mentioned in the slide that when I say our comparisons, I'd love to say Keridikion Citizens Advice had our own singing and dancing uh, comparison site, but I actually mean National Citizens Advice have got a, a comparison site which is uh, excellent. It's very easy to use. Uh, and if you're not using it already, I really strong, strongly recommend that you do. It shows all the market uh, and it gives you then the information about how to contact. Uh, suppliers if you do want to go ahead with a switch or your clients do. Obviously uh, living and working in, in West Wales there's a lot of issues about off gas so a lot of people are having uh, a, an additional premium to their fuel bills because they've got economy seven, they're relying upon oil, LPG etc so you quite often will find that people's fuel bills are, are almost between 50 and 100% more than what off gem says the average. So uh, within Caritigion, uh, with work that uh, Pito from Nest uh, is here at this meeting with some of the work he did in the previous job, uh, they were set up a, a, an excellent network of oil clubs and information about oil clubs so bringing people together to be able to buy oil um, at a discount because they have uh, the uh, buying power of buying in bulk, uh, bulk. Sorry, we do a lot of stuff with billing issues, complaints, uh, trying to assist people with that, as well as, of course, the warm home discount and the priority services register. Um, we also now have um, funding uh, for three months during the COVID uh, 19 period through the energy redress scheme. We actually have emergency funding to assist clients with fuel vouchers to top up their prepay gas and electricity. Um, this is a project which we can't promote directly to the uh, public as part of the requirements of the funder, uh, but it is something that we can promote to partners. And so if you have, if you are working in West Wales and you have any clients who are really struggling to pay for or top up their prepayment meters, please consider doing a referral to us because hopefully they will meet the eligibility criteria and we can assist them uh, with vouchers. The vouchers are worth £28 for a single household, £49 for a family and we have, uh, we, uh, we can give a maximum of three vouchers per person. Okay, so if you do have anybody you want to refer to us, please do. Uh, and then I'm probably over talking because I normally do, but um, just to say these are the actual projects that we currently have within Caradigion. We have the Warm Home Fund project, which is a partnership with Caradigion County Council. Um, we are also, as many other citizens advice in Wales are, um, we have a project and uh, funded by the British Gas Energy Trust called the Warmer Wales uh, project. So I noticed one of my colleagues, Gerald, is at this meeting. I'm sure that they probably do uh, uh, this BGET project. So I'm sure there are lots of citizens' advice uh, throughout Wales who you can uh, access excellent energy advice from. We have a national project called the Energy Advice Programme that's starting on the 1st of August. Not all citizens' advice have this. Caridigion citizens' okay. advice will have this project and funding to March of next year. And then, as I've just mentioned, we have these vouchers under the Energy Redress Scheme as well. Uh, and then, in terms of the pandemic, pandemic challenges, um, I think lots of people have, uh, some of uh, Ben and uh, Joe have already touched upon this. One of the major problems, obviously, that we have is. Whereas before, a lot of our service was actually face-to-face -face home. We did a lot of home research. Obviously, we've not been able to do this since the middle of March. So that 
reduces your ability to have confidence that you're able to cover everything with clients because you're not necessarily seeing all the paperwork. It causes sometimes difficulties and delays in being able to advocate for clients with third parties like energy companies if they're disputes, etc. Um, I think, uh, as Ben mentioned earlier on in his remarks, there's a uh, there's a great alarm that the pandemic is sort of delaying what will become a huge wave of debt issues uh, generally, but in relation to energy bills as well. So there's, it's not just the need for advice services now during the pandemic when people are experiencing drop of income, unemployment, furlough, et cetera, et cetera, but there'll be an even higher demand post lockdown as all these bills keep, as bills come in and people have had this income loss. Um, in relation to other matters, uh, best practice during this period, um, we've continued to be able to deliver energy advice and there's been a huge demand for the service, uh, but the only, uh, the other thing that we've been able to do is promote the service a lot in uh, meetings like this. And we, I think Joe mentioned about the uh, kind of information going out to shielding uh, people within her local authority area where she's working we were able to distribute some information to people in Caradigion through that as well and then as I've mentioned before NEA support the training I've attended some of your forums uh, during the lockdown they were really interesting and they were really excellent as ever so uh, and the fact that you're out there campaigning providing um, high quality training service is always really really positive I've probably gone way over but thank you very much you are dead on time William That's oh. <laughs> thank you so much for, for sharing that and thank you Joe also um, in the next few minutes if anybody has we're very happy I think William and Joe to take a few questions in relation to their presentation so you can either ask that over the chat function or um, raise the hand in the way I described earlier if anybody has and I'll look out with colleagues to see if anybody's got their actual hand raised. If not I know that William... Ben, I've got, I've got a question. Fantastic, is that Gerald? Is, oh, yeah. Hi Gerald, yeah. go for um, it. With the energy redress vouchers we launched last week and we've come across a problem with Eon customers being unable to use the vouchers we've also come there may be issues in relation to using apps using the voucher with maybe a, an online yeah or with an with an app now we've engaged with charis grants to see if there's any way we, that we can we can tackle this issue but obviously you know certainly i had a case last week where i i issued a voucher a family voucher it was crisis and they couldn't use it. Okay, that's, that's concerning. So um, uh, customers with Eon, for some reason, the, the, the voucher doesn't necessarily go through. And likewise, whomever they're supplied by, if they want to add the voucher on via an online or app. Or, or by an app. Challenge. It's an out of interest. Is any colleagues um, either in Will, or outside? Will's got his hand up. Oh, I, yeah, I just, wanted, uh, just wanted to say, um, thank you for the comment, uh, Gerald. Um, my experience is that we we haven't had a problem necessarily with Eon. I'm sure we've had clients with Eon who have been able to use the vouchers. You're absolutely right, though. The vouchers that are only usable either in a pay point or in a pay zone, pay zone or in post offices. Yes. Now some, for example, British Gas, you can only top up in a pay zone. Oh. Yes. You can't, which is in a post office, you yes. can't top up at a pay point. But there isn't, there doesn't appear to, I've had a conversation with British Gas um, themselves about whether or not the voucher numbers can be used um, on the apps with smart meters, for example, because okay. obviously yeah. some clients have got yeah. prepaid smart meters and they can't. They have to take their card to their, if the British Gas, to a post office, if yeah. they're if they're pay zone, oh, sorry, if they're not British Gas, they can either opt for a post office voucher or a, uh, a pay point, pay point voucher, yeah, which yeah. is like spa and co-op, yes. yeah. CKs, etc. Um, I think I agree with, I agree totally with Gerald that that's something that needs to be addressed for the future with Charis grants, etc. Yes. But it's not something, unfortunately, that 
there's not a, an immediate answer to that. No, but that's right, something but to look at for the future. Yeah, we've engaged with them, Will. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get some feedback this week. We raise cool. it on Friday. Brilliant. Oh, thank you. Jimmy, did you have um, a response you wanted? You had your hand raised. Yeah, I was just picking up on what William and Gerald have said. Uh, we're on, we, we've also got the EST redress fund, and it's something that we've come across with a couple of uh, suppliers, not British Gas being one of them, I think EDF, and obviously Eon in the frame. We have raised it, uh, and again, I think the answer we got back is the same that you got back. Mm -hmm. It's there's not much around. We are looking into a workaround on this one. Yes. Uh, we haven't been able to reach one at the moment, but it is basically what we've been told. If it hasn't got a barcode on, because people are, are topping up online, if it's not got a barcode, we the vouchers won't work in the system. Yeah, and I think it will have been raised with uh, energy savings. So I think I think we've raised it with energy savings. Yes, we, we did on Friday, so hopefully yeah. we we'll get something back. And if you're on a so for clarity, if you're on a smart meter. Mm -hmm. um, in prepay mode, you can top up, but you and use that voucher, but you have to do so in the kind of old school traditional way of going. Yeah, card, card, yeah card definitely. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I a couple of questions have come in. I've just one thing to to raise. Nia Morgan has um, clarified, thankfully, that she'll she'll share that amongst other warmer Wales uh, citizens advice projects as well to see what their experiences are. So thank you very much, Nia, for that. I believe Peter has his hand up, and then I'll also hand over to Juliet to ask a question. Also, Peter, would you like to go first? Okay, can you hear me? You can now. Um, it's a question for, for Joe, actually, um, for Warm Wales about the, um, you mentioned the Eco3 management scheme in Powys, Joe. Um, it's an interesting project that you're doing there. You're vetting the um, Eco3 applications for Powys, and that could go around Wales. I just wondered if you had um, a little bit to say about that, because... Uh, in, in the past, we've had costs associated with eco schemes being passed to customers. And so obviously, Ness want to work together with um, Warm Wales on that and, um, if possible, eliminate costs to customers where they might be eligible for Nest, which is obviously free. So I just wondered if you had anything to, to say about that, really, about us working together, really, to, to minimise costs going forward yeah um i'm gonna say this this isn't this isn't a, a cop out or anything um but to do with the whole um eco3 um i've not actually been involved uh with that um that's been um the other project manager lindsay who is actually also in this fuel poverty forum um so she could potentially add um you know as sort of more information to that um but saying that you know as an obviously Warm Wales wants to work in partnership with anybody. Um, and I know that I can take that back, you know, as in to Jonathan, I think you have previously spoken to Jonathan about it. Um, so I don't know if Lindsay wants to add anything. Yeah, yeah thanks, Joe. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've been in meetings, Peter, as you know, we've had meetings with yourselves and you know, we welcome, like Joe says, the ongoing, our relationship with Nest is brilliant. Um, I saw your email you sent me this morning. Apologies, I haven't responded yet because I was on annual leave last week. So. I think it was a misunderstanding of the wording where we said um, we would look for the minimal cost of to the client. Obviously, if the minimal cost is zero, we would go down that route. So whilst we will be working with the eco project, we will always, if, if it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's a choice between Nest, which is obviously zero cost, and eco, which may have a potential additional cost to the client, we will refer them to Nest regardless. So we would always look to give the client zero cost, but then obviously some of the nest, sorry, some of the eco opportunities do have an additional cost, but we are working with our partners to ensure that that is identified as upfront as possible for clients, because we're really aware of previous issues with previous eco, um, eco projects. So we are working on it, and you know, as we've said, as everybody on the call, I'm sure, our priority is always to the client and to give them the best deal that they can get. And I've seen, I will respond to you now this afternoon after a couple of meetings on all the other questions you've put in there as well. That's thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, just one more point on that. Um, thank you, that's brilliant to hear. Um, is the, the customer journey on Eco sometimes is a bit tricky. Um, when, we're never sure where the decision's made to increase the costs after the first point of contact, because 
Sometimes yeah. customers are offered a free free heating system. Yeah, that well, we are confident that won't happen. I can't obviously mm -hmm. give an absolute guarantee because you know some of that is out of our control once we've handed over to contractors. However, those contractors we're working with, building partnerships with, the ones we've so far, I mean the project isn't live, just to be clear, the project isn't actually live at the moment. So we are still in the developmental stage and we are still working out those negotiations. So those that we're working with at the moment have confirmed they will be upfront about any potential cost. Obviously, they can't confirm a cost until they've gone into the home physically and surveyed it, but they will be upfront at the beginning to say, you know, hopefully it is no cost. However, if it goes over whatever, then there may be an additional cost. And we are being very, um, um, we're not offering to every and any, any contractor. So we're working very closely. And we're being very upfront and very honest with contractors. As you say, this is starting in power, so I'm sure colleagues are aware that the Power Seco 2 had issues and had a lot of negative feedback, which was unfortunate. But the benefit of that is we've taken all that negative feedback and we're having that at the beginning of our project. So we're able to hopefully eliminate those issues before we start. Thank you very Thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, um, there's two more questions, which I promise, and then we'll move into the workshop. I think Juliet was first, and then there's one from Alison, and then I'll introduce the workshop. Juliet. Yes, it was just um, a question for Will, really, although it kind of raises um, a wider issue around the plethora, I suppose, of, um, of different um, amounts of funding going into energy advice and the different things that are available locally. So I'm just thinking about information that I can share with um, our team. So I work for Care and Repair Cymru. We've got 13 agencies working across Wales, um, all in all. And uh, Will, you mentioned um, were various... Um, different, um, I suppose, levels of advice, maybe levels of support going on around the different citizens' advice, depending on whether they had British gas funding or the energy redress funding or whatever, whatever. And I'm just thinking, how do I, how do I share that information with my uh, colleagues? Is there anywhere which which explains that in a Wales wide way, so that I can share it, and you know, my colleagues in Flintshire can pick up the bits that are relevant to them, can see whether there's anything going on in Flintshire. Is there anything that, that maps that at all? Um, thank you very much for your uh, question, Juliet. Um, I think I would want to probably discuss that with colleagues at uh, Citizens Advice Cymru, because obviously. I work for Citizens Advice Ceredigion. I am aware that other Citizens Advice have energy projects, but I, I can't claim to know every single energy advice project that's going on in every individual Citizens Advice um, in Wales. So I note that uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Nia from Citizens Advice Cymru is involved with this. So if I try to uh, liaise with her, and then I will try and come back to you on what you just asked uh, via an email or something. So, okay, Julia. Yeah, cheers, thanks. I suppose it's sort of linked as well to Warm Wales because you're doing different things in different parts of the country as well. It makes me think about the big mapping project. I think Tidir, I think Tidir's on this call as well, um, was doing around energy advice, different, what's available locally. It's really quite complex and quite a changing situation as well as a result of COVID. Um, and I just wonder, I suppose this is just a plea really, that we, we, we can get our heads around this. Job, job for you, I think there, Ben, I think. <laughs> it's an ongoing challenge, isn't it? Especially with funding, when funding comes and goes, and things start up mm. for a year, two years or so, and then shut down as well. But no, absolutely, we are really keen, obviously, to make sure that we are aware of the various support that's available and that we can share that amongst all stakeholders and members and partners across across Wales and even when it comes down to the, the training for example that Gareth was that was referencing earlier you know if he's working in a particular area within Wales as well then obviously then people are clear that the support and local provision that's available too um, and as we say we can keep those conversations going online and, and as you referenced the conversations we were having around uh, with Tidia and Stephen and with Welsh Gov are really important there also so thank you very much <coughs> I'll hand over to you for, with a final question if that's okay and then we will move into the workshop because I'm just conscious of time which is my bad yeah, I'll, I'll talk quickly, Ben. You know that I can I can usually do that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Alison. I'm from Pobble Homes and Communities. Um, just a very quick thing to echo what Will said earlier. Um, I've done both level three and level two with NEA um, Cumbria, and it is brilliant, brilliant training. So I would urge anyone that hasn't done that to do that. But my question is for Joe. Um, just on your um, initial slides, you referenced um, a voids project. 
And just a couple of things around that. I was wondering if A, you could just say maybe a little bit more about that. And also, is it Wales wide? And is, it, um, is there any particular lessons learned that you've got from that voids work you've done? Um, to do with the work, that's something um, that one of my colleagues um, is more, you know, as in sort of leading on. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, it's being able to provide, um, you know, as in sort of access and making sure that if there's any void properties that housing associations or councils have access to, um, it's looking at, you know, as in sort of the metering um, and the cheaper. So I know that some, um, you know, as in sort of housing associations go with SSE, some go with British Gas, I think Flint should go with British Gas. So again, it's being able to work in partnership and to basically get the, you know, as in sort of the better and, and the best deals um, that we are, you know, as an another, you know, as an option, um, you know, as in to look at. Um, I've included my email address um, in the in the chat box. Um, so if you want to send me an email and then we can correspond and I can, you know, some sort of copy you in one of my colleagues um, and we can explore that in more detail. That'd be great. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Thank you both very much. Thank you. OK, I'm just going to share a slide one final time just to introduce the um, the workshop with you all. So just bear with me a second as I do that. Um, <clears throat> OK, uh, not wrong one. Can you all see the workshop slide? I hope, I hope that's come up. And um, essentially what we are conscious of, and I thank you so much to our speakers, Joe and, and, and William also, um, is that as they said, working through COVID has been a challenging time for organisations and of course for those that you support too. And we're really keen to hear your views on this. As many of you will be aware, we actually conducted a call for evidence with stakeholders across the four nations throughout May and early June to gauge views and experiences on how different stakeholders and organisations, as well as their clients and consumers, have been impacted by the outbreak. And um, we had 73 respondents in total, mostly from not-for-profits and local authorities, but also from suppliers, networks, installers and, and housing providers too. And a quarter of those were from Wales, which is superb. So thank you so much for that. And another seven on top of that worked across GB or the UK. Um, we found that as part of that, for example, 78% of respondents in Wales said that there have been significant impacts on their ability to deliver fuel poverty related support and services. 100% in Wales said that there was either a moderate or high risk that energy had become less affordable for fuel fuel households during the crisis. And then 60% of respondents in Wales said that they've seen an increase in the number of clients that were also seeking to access the benefits system, a little like William and, and others talked about earlier in terms of income maximisation. So really keen with so many people on the call to provide opportunity to discuss how COVID has impacted you and your organisations. So we'd like to break out into a workshop now um, into six different rooms so that people are kind of split into up to 10 people per session to have a look at the three questions you see on this slide. So I'll just hand over to my colleague Jimmy who's going to set that up and just give you a couple more thoughts about how it will work and then another colleague will break us automatically into rooms for us. Over to you Jimmy. Thanks Ben. I think Ben's covered most of what I was going to say anyway. We've, we've tried the, uh, we're trying these breakout rooms to try and provide a bit of uh, interactivity if you like. Uh, I say we've, we've provided three questions. Ben sort of touched on in his policy brief, but Joe and William were given a brief to sort of include. So again all we're looking at is them three questions on it, uh, just what challenges you've put, uh, faced, uh, what has worked or hasn't worked for you, and is there any way uh, any aid can help go forward on this one? And just interesting, just a couple of points. We will pick up on utilities actually, the and the warm home discount question in the question and answer session after the breakout. Um, ben mentioned about a couple of things about what's going to happen. Now, uh, the government reacted in the energy industry. One of the th things that we I, I personally picked up is they were not pursuing debt at one point. All bets are off on that. There was only three months left on that one. What we're now finding is that energy companies are now proactively pursuing debts again. Again, the problem we have with this is we're not out of COVID yet. Again, we have raised it with policy change, but it's them kind of things, so sort of what have you experienced? Uh, we're allowing, we, we did have 25 minutes for the breakout. Uh, you will be assigned, we tried to assign as many people, so we've got a nice mix and match on the groups, so you'll get uh, an indication of what uh, breakout group. After about 20, 25 minutes, you will get like a 60 minute, uh, 60 minute, 60 second mm -hmm. one to come out of the breakout. Uh, you can try your very best to finish your sentence off in that. Doesn't always work. Uh, there will be the comment uh, or the chat box element that you can pick up on the breakout if there's anything that we miss pop it a question or a comment in the, uh, the chat box and hopefully we will be able to pick them up in the Q&A when we come back into the main room um, in about 20 minutes. 
So hopefully our admin team are going to press a button any minute now um, for you to be all assigned to it. We do have facility, facilitators within the room, both Ben, Gareth, myself, William, Joel, and someone else. Um, Helen, I think, is staying behind. Danielle. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, oh, sorry, and Mike and Danielle. So there are people who will be making uh, comments or making recorded comments, and we'll feed back when we come back into the main room. Thank you all so much for your contributions and, and views. I'm really grateful to, to see so many of you still on online and to attend today. I really, really appreciate that. We were keen to make sure that we could get one of these forums up and running as quick as possible when I rejoined. And obviously COVID felt like an appropriate thing to, to focus on um, um, and particularly keen also to make sure that we leave space later this year to convene again around the new fuel poverty plan for Wales um, if that is released on, on time or so. Um, I think with the last kind of 10 minutes that we have or so, if it's okay, if perhaps just for kind of one minute and a half each, I haven't got a stopwatch, but I'll just pretend we can just kind of feedback um, the facilitators just on kind of the overall thoughts from the, the sessions, just so we can share those amongst themselves. So, Jimmy, just to put you on the spot, would you mind if you started with your group? I want to surprise you. I won't take the 90 seconds on this, Ben. Uh, there yeah. was only just a couple of things come out, the, the group that we were in. Um, sitting in the vice, the, the sort of look at the age profile has come down about clients who are acting healthy. Usually it's sort of the, the older end of the market around about 30, 35. Um, again, warm on discount. We said about the Scottish Power, I believe, are now open for taking registration for warm home discounts. Um, and from, I think, Dylan from Nest was the, he found that a lot of organisations were now asking because of the restrictions with assistance that they were getting more individual cases rather than across the board, specific cases that were in basically dire need. And that was, that was about it from our group. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Danielle, you happen on my screen, at least, to be sat next to Jimmy. So would you mind if I hand over to you next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll just go through them sort of in order. We talked um, some really good contributions in the group. And um, in terms of challenges, I think probably not unique. I think the, the full, full uh, attendee list will have similar things around backlogs and how they work through backlogs now in where, where installation or where work had to stop in that, that immediate instance. Um, I think there was a mention of sort of advisors working at like 150% of capacity now and how, how we support those people even more so and, and, and what that looks like. Um, what you can and can't do on the telephone or digitally or via other mechanisms and that's both providing opportunities but still ongoing challenges and differences like what you miss when you're not in the home. Um, and thinking around things around agile working and preparedness. So some organisations are obviously much more ready and prepared, and that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It was just, you know, history of an organisation or the way in which the last few years have, have, have shown sort of development within different ways. But I guess there's quite nicely leading on to the second bit, there's there's some really clear best practice to be shared from those that were perhaps a little bit more ready for the sort of a digital way of working. Um, uh, some of the sort of the, the best practices, not just relating to vulnerable consumers, but uh, what came out around team support and being virtually being able to check in with teams and where that's been done, that's worked really well. I say that that's been my, my experience with NEA actually within the first month as well. Um, and just being able to find that psychological and emotional support that you would have got in the advice setting if you were, if you were in an organisation anyway. Um, and in terms of working with the consumers, um, a lot of stuff around keeping in touch or wellbeing calls that were coming through is really sort of vital uh, going forward about having those touch points with with the people that you're supporting um, and then it's things around agile working so sort of being able to reach further uh, faster and do do more I guess in, in certain days in terms of what could have once before been, been home working. NEA um, things like this continue please touch points again with with places like NEA around places bringing people together uh, understanding what we're doing so I think your policy update may be stuff that the research team can do there as well and, and delivery team may be feeding into five ten minutes but understanding what we're doing because that might trigger ways in which uh, the the members of today can, can touch in with us and say actually we might be able to support or help or learn from that um and yeah and then mapping so some of the frontline workers being able to understand what other frontline workers are doing across so being able to see that bigger picture is really helpful and i guess forums like this are, are an ideal start point Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, really valid. Gareth, you're sat the other side of Jimmy, so could I hand over to you? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, we covered quite a lot in, in the short amount of time that we, we did have. Um, so in terms of uh, 
uh, from care and repairs angle, um, something that really came up was the loss of um, businesses for, for their contractors that, that, that they work with. So obviously delaying work then uh, and delaying support that the client group could get. Um, also things like problems within the supply chain, the cost of materials rising, all of those th kind of things that are linked um, and the concerns around that linking to the decarbonisation agenda. And, and you know, we did touch on what happens if there's a second wave um, you know, all these plans in place, um, the, the sort of delays to the work that could be carried out as a result. Um, not not being able to visit client groups w was a common theme. That obviously came up. We talked a little bit about people being um, digitally excluded. These are great. You know, the, the, this, this way of communicating is great if people can, can manage it. But overall, there was a general sense that people prefer face-to-face -face appointments or um, might not be able to access, access things digitally. So um, Rian mentioned Digital Communities Wales. have do, been doing some excellent work in trying to reach out and hopefully, you know, people can learn and adapt. We, we looked a little bit at the creative ways in which people are, are changing their working practices to get out and reach clients um, things like uh, the hubs in Cardiff being being open but also teams actually going and physically door knocking uh, you know actually trying to reach out to communities and those in need the most who, who might not normally access those services um, and, and bearing that in mind that if there is to be a second wave that I suppose we'd be a little bit more prepared that this time around um, and yeah we didn't get really into um, what NEA can do, but I think coming together, bringing all the organisations together under one umbrella is a good opportunity to share how people have, have been uh, responding to this and hopefully taking that learning across and, and preparing for, for, for the, next, the next step in this process. So, yeah, it was a great group. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. There's, you know, what we learned from this period, um, that's good, but we have to learn from it then. Otherwise, you know, if you head into a second lockdown and you don't take on board the, the experiences that we've had, the positive and negative, then that's such a missed, missed opportunity, isn't it? Um, William, could I hand over to you if that's okay? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, can I firstly thank everyone uh, in Breakout Room 5 for all your fantastic contributions to our discussion. Uh, a lot of this stuff that um, has already been brought up, were, came across in the discussions that we had. Uh, there were a couple of people in the room who were working for housing associations who were pointing out the fact that uh, some of the difficulties they faced during the lockdown has been uh, big increases in rent arrears because of the impact of COVID on people's income, etc., which has also impacted on, the, on those tenants' ability to... Uh, top up the difficulties they had with digitally trying to uh, claim universal credit etc and um, so that was and the, the the fact that the housing associations will work in a holistic way and safeguarding is something that they take very seriously and that their ability to do that during the pandemic was slightly uh, diminished as a result of the fact that they couldn't do face-to-face -face home visits etc um, as was mentioned uh, I think it was in Jimmy's group uh, near Fond Citizens Advice Cymru mentioned about the fact that some of the age profile of clients uh, has changed during the uh, lockdown, maybe seeing slightly younger clients than were traditional clients for energy advice projects, and also the concern, which I think was shared across everyone, about how, uh, you know, the it's great that people are accessing the service but who isn't accessing the service what are the needs of those people are they digitally excluded etc are there people out there who desperately need the services but can't use phones uh, etc and we would be normally reliant on knocking on people's doors uh, knocking on the office door to come and uh, seek advice and the fact that as you know as you are doing telephone advice etc you can't necessarily be as holistic in terms of the advice and the difficulties of advocating because you can't get uh, client authority uh, to be able to advocate with energy suppliers. Some of the best practice, one of the housing associations has a specific grant during this period to assist people with rent arrears and maybe fuel poverty and food poverty to assist them. So that's a really good um, scheme. Uh, Cardiff City Council were looking at improving and streamlining their uh, knowledge of services to be able to sign post to so trying to get people to the advice a uh, right advice provider for the problems uh, that they were facing uh, one of the housing associations were proactively going out and uh, well, 
via the phone, I should say, contacting everybody who they knew were, run, uh, were their, their tenants to try and explore with them issues about the difficulties they were facing through lockdown and also trying to assist anybody who was vulnerable or not. And uh, at least some of the citizens' advice have been doing something similar. And in relation to the last point uh, about how NEA can help us, uh, I've, I've, somebody mentioned earlier on, these type of forums are fantastically useful. The campaigning work you do is fantastically useful, as is the training work that you're continuing to provide during this period and uh, into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Joe, if you're still there, could I um, just hand over? Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be really, really quick as well, because um, obviously I've just looked at, you know, us in sort of time things. Um, so yeah, so to basically, you know, as I sort of mirror what everyone's saying about um, digital exclusion, um, I think that's something that people are um, experiencing more and more, um, and something that was raised. Um, was to do with um, providing support on energy bills, but also being able to get evidence um, for benefits and things. So if you wanted to put through for eco or, you know, sort of anything else like that. Normally we're in someone's house and we can see the information there right in front of us. There are some people out there who might have access to phones, but trying to get someone to take a picture of an energy bill and then send it through so that it's easy to understand, that's becoming, uh, you know, as in sort of quite difficult. And I've experienced a couple of issues with um, some, uh, some photos that have been sent through that didn't really show what I needed. Um, and then um, sort of moving on um, to the, the best practice, we had a good discussion about, you know, we're all working really, really hard and we've all changed. Obviously, you've already heard about the work that we've been doing um, in North Wales um, and being able to link in with those people who are more vulnerable, who we wouldn't necessarily have spoken to because of the work we've done with the voluntary councils. Um, so I think that way of working is quite good. Um, but a quick final point, obviously, NEA, keep doing what you're doing because it really, really helps. These forums are fab, um, but it was suggested that there is a way that we can have some sort of working group or way that we can all stay in contact with each other. I know, yes, we have emails, but there might be certain topics or things you know as in so rather than waiting for each forum to happen um but also i quite like it that i've been able to mix and um, see people face to face colleagues from south wales who i wouldn't necessarily mix with and i think that's been really really beneficial um to be able to mix it so i don't know yeah whether or not you could facilitate something somehow to keep us all talking to each other um which would then help with you know as in signposting knowing what's being delivered um across the whole of wales Fantastic. That's it. Thank you very much. And actually, very similar thoughts um, came up in, in our group also, actually, about whether it's useful to have a regional focus at some forums, but also to have an all Wales wide one at others, because that brings additional benefits and opportunities that not everyone would always have. So no, lots of food for thought for us. Also, and um, very briefly in relation to ours, we had very similar, you know, experiences in terms of authority to act mechanisms and um, the insight that you lose from not being able to go into people's homes and um, being very different over the phone in, in that respect. And actually some examples of improved customer service when um, some suppliers were working from home compared to what the business as usual might often have been like as well, which may be coming to an end and awareness that some of the debt recovery and other things as Jimmy and others mentioned earlier uh, are kind of building back up again. And um, please forgive me entirely my fault for running four minutes over, but just to wrap up and in conclusion, um, thank you all so much for coming today. Honestly, really, really appreciate it. And we're so pleased that we can get this off the ground and running so early on back um, to when I rejoined also. Particular thanks to Joe and William and Jamie who uh, presented um, for us. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you to colleagues Brian, Mike, uh, Jimmy, Gareth and Danielle for attending also in all your support. I did very little to prepare for this compared to them. <laughs> but I hope look forward to seeing you all again in the future. I hope to see you uh, soon post kind of the end of September, particularly when the new fuel poverty plan for Wales is expected if that's on time as well. It'd be good to convene around all of that. In the meantime, I hope you all keep warm and well and I will see you very soon. Thank you all.